Hello everyone. So today we'll discuss about uh, coronavirus disease. So I'm uh, Dr. Ayala Zodi. I'm uh, an assistant professor of emergency medicine I'm from Madrid in Paul Hospital Medical College. So this presentation is uh, uh, developed based on the current recommendations from uh, WHO, from CDC and also other studies, especially from uh, Chinese experience. And uh, this is only for uh, educational purpose. So we'll discuss about the introduction about the COVID-19 and how the clinical presentation and how can you diagnose it and how can you manage, especially in the emergency in the ICU setting. So as you know, coronavirus disease or COVID-19 so it's named as uh, COVID-19 because it's uh, originally detected in uh, Wuhan, China in uh, December 2019. So it's one of the respiratory tract infection which is caused by newly uh, emergent uh, coronavirus. Today, April 7, 2020, 1.53 million people are confirmed, 74,782 died. And most 186,000 recovered. In Ethiopia, 44 cases were confirmed, four cases recovered, and we have two days. So those patients who are infected will have a presentation like fever, cough, shortness of breeze, and upper respiratory tract symptoms, GI symptoms, even like diarrhea, vomiting, and there are also ENT symptoms like anosmia. So diagnosis is mainly clinical, right? in palestry, and you should have asked detailed travel history, or also contact history, okay? or for uh, infected people, and then imaging can be used as uh, supportive. COVID-19 testing should be done for uh, every suspected patient. So diagnostic, and they would have lymphopenia if you see CBC, and then uh, you can do chest X-ray to see ground like glass opacities, and ultrasound can be done to see pleural line thickening, or B lines, and then uh, consolidation. Okay? Consolidation with the airborne program can be seen. The, so currently, CT is recommended for um, those patients with COVID. So ground glass opacity, consolidation, and the special characteristics, which is known as crazy paving pattern, uh, can be detected. As you see here on CT scan, this is a ground glass opacity. And here also you see a ground glass opacity with airborne program. And then this is a special feature, which is a crazy paving pattern, which have a ground glass opacity with intralobular and uh, uh, interlobular thickening. Or, and also in uh, ultrasound, so you will have uh, pleural thickening in uh, B lines, multiple B lines, and also air bronchogram okay, with uh, consolidation uh, can be seen. So the diagnostic testing COVID-19 uh, can be done from nasopharyngeal swab test or uh, oropharyngeal swab test can be done. So the severity can be divided into four types, a mild URI symptoms or a respiratory tract infection, COVID-19, and mild pneumonia, COVID-19, severe COVID-19, and a critical COVID-19 or ARDS can be uh, classification. This is a mild one, a mild URI COVID-19. The patient could have uncomplicated upper respiratory tract viral infection, which could have uh, non-specific symptoms like fever, fatigue, cough, you could have with or without uh, sputum production, neuroxia, malaise, muscle pain, sore throat, dyspnea, nasal congestion or headache can be uh, there and uh, really patient could have even diarrhea, nausea and vomiting. The other classification is mild pneumonia. So the patient have typical feature for pneumonia, but they, couldn't, they didn't have severity signs. So the severe COVID-19, the patient could have um, fever with respiratory infection uh, plus one of the following. So respiratory rate more than 30, severe respiratory distress, saturations less than 90, on room air is a sign for severity. So this severe COVID 
19 should be closed D observed. And the last one is a critical COVID-19 or ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So these are, they have an acute onset within one week. Or the chest imaging could have a radiography or CT or lambda ultrasound, which shows bilateral opacities, which are not explained by the volume overload or lobular or lung collapse. And also they could be no nodules. Okay? So the origin of this infiltrate should be pulmonary origin. So we should have respiratory failure, which is not explained by other uh, cardiac or uh, fluid volume. Okay? And the last one is they could have oxygen impairment. Oxygen impairment. Oxygen impairment in adults can be divided like mild, moderate, severe uh, ARDs, where you can uh, do PO2 and the FiO2. Uh, if it is in the range of 200 to 300, it's mild ARDs, whereas uh, from 100 to 200, it's moderate. And uh, if it's severe, it's uh, less than 100. Okay? So when PAO2 is not available, uh, so you can do a uh, saturation over FiO2. Uh, then uh, if it's less than 315, it suggests uh, ARDs. Okay. The management of COVID-19. So the first thing is always safety. So infection prevention and control should be the priority. And the patient should be isolated. Still now, there is no effective therapy. And as you know, always prevention is better than cure. So we have to prevent the spread to the community. So treating the mild COVID-19 starts with isolation and standard infection prevention. It's mainly supportive. So you treat it the fever with antipyretics, you tell them to sulfide rates, and then just monitor them until uh, they are, are symptom free. Those will mild pneumonia. So you start the management as a mild URI symptoms, and then you start them empiric oral antibiotics. Those with severe COVID-19, you start with PP as always, antipyretics, fluid therapy should be conservative. Oxygen therapy will see later. Empiric antibiotics should be started. So for severe COVID-19, respiratory distress, hypoxia or shock, so it should be on oxygen with a target of more than 94. You can initiate with five liter and you can titrate up to the target. During resuscitation should be more than entry. Or you can directly use face mask with a reservoir if the patient is critical from, you know, from the if the patient is critical from the initial. Once the patient is stable, the target is to make more than 90% in non-pregnant adults, whereas to make more than 90 to 95 in pregnant. All areas where patients with COVID-19 are kept for should be equipped with pulse oximeter, functioning oxygen system, disposable single-use oxygen delivery interface like nasal cannula, nasal prongs, simple face mask, and mask with a reservoir bag. And they should have close monitoring as well as because those patients with severe COVID-19 will develop respiratory failure and they have to treat co-infections with empiric antibiotics. And the last one is critical COVID-19 or RDS. So these are uh, patients who require intubation, mechanical ventilation, and treatment co-infection and complications, like respiratory failure, renal failure, and the multi-organ failure. And the other is trial therapies. Okay. So first one is endotracheal intubation. So intubation is difficult and complicated in such patients. This is because Patients have minimal to no respiratory reserve and their compensatory mechanism have already been exhausted. So they will desaturate easily and they don't give you time. So due to strict infection control and the urgency of intubation, a careful airway evaluation may not be done. So because of that, so always you better anticipate difficult and complicated intubation. And the last one is level three personal protective equipment. It makes the performance of the project clumsy. It may 
easily compromise the integration process. During integration, you should have standard level three protection or insulator and modified rapid sequence duration is preferred, which is a slower form of a rapid sequence duration. It should be controlled, okay, controlled. The video laryngoscope is preferable with a disposable cover and it should be done by trained and experienced person. So when you say standard level of protection, it starts with hand disinfection, and you should apply your head cap, and then the protective mask is in 95. Disposable latex glove, an isolation gown, protective clothing then you apply surgical mask the full head coat should be applied To cover disposable gown and then disposable lattice gloves. This is how you uh, protect yourself during uh, intubating a patient with COVID-19. Double mask with N95 filter inside gowns and double gloves should be worn by the intubating team. And the person who is performing intubation should wear a third pair of gloves and remove them immediately after intubation. So this is an example how we should uh, wear during intubation, the team from uh, another country, how they are going to intubate. After you do the preparation, then you have to pre-oxygenate for at least five minutes with 100% effort. So to avoid virus scattering, you better avoid mask ventilation. But if it's really needed, you should cover the area around the patient's mouth and nose with gauze. And then uh, two hand mask seal should be done. Sarkin should be readily available and because fogging of the goggles is, as you know, a serious problem during our uh, rapid intubation. So you better cover the inner side of the goggles with a layer of anti fogging agents such as uh, transparent hand sanitizer. So during intubation or RSI, you may need to calm the patient. So midazolam or diazepam can be administered. And uh, intravenous lidocaine can be given to decrease uh, coughing. The choice in dose of anesthetics should be determined on a case by case basis with the patient's hemodynamic stability, severity of illness, and also mental status. So, ketamine, 1 to 2 mg per kg, succinylcholine, 1 to 2 mg per kg, as used most of the time, can be used. So cricoid compression or displacement is needed when a cover exposure of the cord is difficult and the patient's fasting time is unknown. And then immediately after you visualize and intubate with the video laryngoscope, preferably you have to inflate the cuff immediately and then attach the tube directly to the veins. And then you have to confirm the tube placement. But here 
please don't confirm the depths of ET2 using those cultures. And thyroid carbon dioxide measurement is a better indicator of successful intubation. So after intubation, the outer layer of the protective device should be removed okay, before any contact to a patient or another equipment in the area and dispose used in all disposable items that were brought into the room in trash cans. Dispose used and all disposable items that were brought into the room in trash cans. The contaminated instruments must not be taken from the contaminated area to the clean area. And hand cleansing with disinfectant containing alcohol is necessary. The proper and meticulous PPE, personal protective equipment, the same precaution should be considered during extubation. Measures to prevent patient hesitation, coughing should be considered. So the other, after intubation, you have to put the patient on a ventilator. There are studies which recommend you better assess the need of mechanical ventilation. How is the resource allocation? The ethical consideration and about the decision. You better decide now, as in a country, which patient should be intubated and put on a vent. How can you distribute resources to different hospitals? And how is the ethical issue can be managed? This should have protocol. So management, if you decide to put the patient on a vent, studies are recommending lung protective ventilation. So this lung protective ventilation emphasizes with a lower tidal volume, with four to eight ml per kg predicted body weight, lower respiratory pressure with plateau pressure less than 30, respiratory rate less than 35, and higher peak expiratory pressure, more than five, permissive hypercapnia is allowed. So the initial tidal volume could be 6 ml per kg of predicted body weight, and the tidal volume can be allowed to increase up to eight, based on the patient. So the use of sedition may be required to control respiratory drive and to achieve tidal volume targets. When a patient with moderate or severe ARDs, a higher PIP is required. So PIP titration requires consideration of the benefits like reducing the atelic trauma and improving alveolar recruitment with the risk of ending respiratory overextension, which leads to lung injury and higher pulmonary vascular distance. So this is the recommendation how to set up a ventilator to have a lung protective ventilation. So you first thing is you have to calculate the ideal body weight or the predicted body weight, whether it's male or female, based on inch or centimeters. You can select any ventilator mode. You can use AC VCV or AC PCV or any other mode that you have. See the ventilator setting to achieve initial tidal volume of 8 ml per kg and then you reduce the tidal volume by 1 ml per kg with interval of less than 2 hours until you get a tidal volume of 6 ml per kg predicted body weight. Then set the initial rate to approximate the baseline minute ventilation. It shouldn't be more than 35 but it shouldn't be very low. And then adjust the tidal volume and the respiratory rate to achieve the pH and also plateau pressure goals. Goal of oxygen, it should be, PO2 should be 55 to 80, and saturation should be 88 to 95. PO2 should be 55 to 80, and saturation should be 88 to 90. With a minimum of PIP of five, and you can consider incremental of a fail to PIP combination of the recommendation. So the plateau pressure goal should be less than 30, and they have to check the plateau pressure by, uh, holding the inspiratory pause for 0.5 seconds. And uh, at least every four hours should be done and uh, after you change the PIP and the tidal volume. So if the plateau pressure is more than 30, you can decrease the tidal volume by one ml per kg to the minimum of four ml per kg. If the plateau pressure is less than 25 and the tidal volume is less than six, you can increase the tidal volume by one until you get a plateau pressure more than 25. If the plateau pressure is less than 30, 
and if the patient have breeze stacking or uh, desynchrony, you have to increase the tidal volume by one ml per kg up to seven or eight ml per kg if the plateau pressure persists in this acid. And the pH should be 7.3 to 7.45. If the patient have alkalosis and pH is more than 7.45, decrease the ventrate rate acidosis, pH less than 7.3. If it is 7.15 to 7.3, you can increase the respiratory rate until you get the pH more than 7.3. If the pH is less than 7.15, you can increase to 35. And if this remains less than 7.5, you can increase the tidal volume by one ml per kg. You can also consider giving sodium bicarbonate. The other studies are recommending to do prone positioning. In adult patients with severe ARDS, prone ventilation for at least 12 to 16 hours per day is recommended. Even studies are recommended to start it early than late. So the other measures, so keep the patient in semi-recumbent position, the head of the bed more than 30 to 45 degrees, and use a closed suction system periodically and drain and discard condensate in tubing. Use a new ventilator circuit for each patient. Once patient is ventilated, change circuit if it's soiled or damaged. You don't need to change it routinely. Change heat moisturizer exchanger when it malfunctions or when we soiled or every five to seven days. So you better avoid disconnecting the patient from the vent, which will result in loss of the PIP and atelectasis. So in addition, the inspiratory and expiratory connectors should have a viral filter. Always safety. So avoid direct contact to patient and then non-protective, non controlled environment should be avoided. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation should be used in selected patient. You better avoid it. Nebulizer therapy should be avoided. You better use uh, MDI, method dose in others. Avoid awake intubation. And close functioning is recommended. Personal protective equipment during intubation and also situation should be done. Other therapies, studies we show like chloroquine, steroids, and other antivirals are tried, still or are on investigation. So until we get clear direction, so we better be cautious. So we have to pray, we have to save our country, ourselves, and our family. Thank you, keep safe.